just that the drought, the, oh, they missed all the good stuff. Um, how the drought has sort of um, disappeared from the news a little bit. Yeah. Like it was a big deal. We got CNN talking about drought and now uh, we're on to other things. So this is an interesting year and this is sort of the ephemera of um, an important topic that, you know, how do we keep it in the public's eye and how do we care about it? Because it's still a, um, a point of concern. Um, and then I'm trying to go short so that we could actually talk. Uh, last time I uh, was presenting, of course it was on Zoom, but we were here for two hours. Uh, so I, I, you know, I, I thought I would respect your time as well. And, you know, I could talk about this stuff all night, uh, but the library does close at eight. If I remember correctly. Yeah. I used to actually it's going to close a little bit early. So you might hear some announcements. Okay. So I'll, I have, a, I have, I, I'm trying to make it interesting and short if I can. Um, a quick explanation of the Colorado River. Um, these, uh, this is a planar plot. It's a very steep river. Um, some of the fastest whitewater in North America is through the Grand Canyon. Um, but we have a number of tributaries and then, um, let's see, I got my, As, as a modified river system, the river is now a series of pools and drops. The pools being the reservoirs, and then the drops, of course, being the free-flowing sections of river. In Wyoming, we have Fontenelle, uh, we have Flaming Gorge. Those are some of the top dams on the Green River section of the river. And then they're gonna go into Lake Powell the, and Lake Mead, the largest man-made reservoirs uh, we have in uh, the United States. Canyon, in terms of water management is um, basically a conveyance channel. It's cheaper to use the Grand Canyon to move water than it is to you know, put a pipeline in. Uh, that is sort of uh, sarcastic, but it's also, it effectively is one of the greater channels for moving water. Our utilization of the, Grand Can or the, of the Colorado River is multivariate, of course. Um, and as we think about what we're doing with water, Agriculture has one of the primary water rights. I said I wasn't going to talk about law, but it's all about rights. Um, so uh, pivot, uh, this is in the Uinta Basin, but really important um, is uh, Yuma Imperial Valley. This is where the water goes. So where does the Colorado River flow? It flows down to Yuma and then comes back to us in our grocery store and we have spring greens, right? This is a really important, we're connected to the Colorado River and it's really an important massive amount of economy. Um, energy is also really important. Uh, there's uh, the Uinta Basin, um, a lot of production uh, of oil. Um, the Navajo Power Generating Station uh, was closed a few years ago. So this was, um, this photo is from our expedition. Um, this thing was blown up. I think it was at a difference of about a penny per kilowatt hour uh, made it so it wasn't utiliz uh, the utility of maintaining one of the newer coal plants in, the, in North America. Um, it was shut down because of um, basically changes in the energy market. Um, hydropower, this is Glen Canyon Dam. This is uh, for conservation groups, sometimes the bigger concern is what do we do with Glen Canyon Dam? 760 feet tall, a lot of concrete there. Um, and this uh, actually stabilizes the Western power grid in ways that other energy sources can't. Um, and so as we're talking about Lake Powell going down in uh, water level, the head pressure has changed and we haven't had full energy generation out of Glen Canyon um, for a number of years now. My little green dots are just sort of like giving you a rough idea where I conceptually put most of these activities. The Colorado River Basin also is not within the basin. Um, so when we talk about water supply and management, who's getting the water and where, uh, there was a, uh, it made a lot of news since we were thinking about uh, water uh, about a month ago before we had this great snowpack. 
um, a community outside of Scottsdale. It was a wild, what we call in Arizona, a wildcat community. So they never were plumbed to the water supply system. This is outside of Scottsdale. Scottsdale would not supply them with water and they have no legal obligation to supply them with water. So this was, it was a sort of a hopeful development, but that made a lot of news. Um, uh, and so, but Phoenix is plumbed, Tucson is plumbed, Yuma, of course, Los Angeles, San Diego, Los Angeles paid for Boulder Dam, um, more or less, uh, Santa Fe, Albuquerque. So when we talk about the Colorado River in a larger scale, you know, we talk about 40 million people depending on the system, but the water is actually going to these very specific communities. Cheyenne is also uh, receives its water from the Colorado. Um, they have a 1952 water right, I believe it is, might be 54. And so um, in the legalese, we were concerned, Wiofile had an article about this, about Cheyenne maybe getting, a, maybe getting cut off uh, from the Colorado River because if there is a call from the lower basins, a deviation into weird law, if there's a call in the lower basin, they have priority right. California was a state before all the other states, right? So California has a primary, very strong right. Cheyenne has a 1952 right. California has an 1880s right. Who gets water first? So this is the management portion of the whole, of the whole game. So if there was a call in the river, Cheyenne would be cut off. And that's just, there's no, no questions about it. So uh, there's a lot of industrial activity outside of Cheyenne that got actually cut off because Cheyenne was uncertain of its water right. And that was just this year alone. So like I said, the future is rolling right, right now. It's, it's actually a pretty exciting time to be thinking about these things. Um, and of course, there's recreation. Uh, this is Bob. Um, he had been tracking our expedition. Uh, he runs a guiding service on Lake Powell. Uh, you can get out on jet skis, go bass fishing. Um, Bob was really stoked. He actually ditched his clients and came over and talked to us for a while and gave him some stickers and stuff. Um, but, you know, how we use the reservoirs, we've changed the economy of the river by this new, you know, agriculture is really important, energy is really important, but now we have these billion dollar industries of recreation. Where do they fit into the water, right? And how do we, you know, again, where does science come in to inform uh, their activities? Uh, and of course, yeah, uh, whitewater rafting. Um, that's a, a major industry in the uh, basin as well. As we add to this, and this is where the science community is coming in, we, we want to remember that um, part of our role uh, in doing research is that there is, you know, everything that we do, uh, energy production, agricultural production, recreation, there is a science component, but it's always a societal component. And so we're doing this for somebody and our values have shifted from, um, you know, 1930s when we put Lake Mead in, we didn't think about the cultural resources at all. I have no idea what's underneath the waters of Lake Mead. Uh, I do understand that there's boats and some other things. There's a bad joke laying in there, but, um, but in Lake Powell, we have a complete inventory, not, well, a pretty good inventory of the cultural resources. And as Lake Powell has gone down, these resources have reemerged, and so we have to. We're now in a position where we're addressing, you know, um, hunting grounds or crossings that are culturally significant to large groups of people, who um, have been there for a long time. As we look at the river, sort of in our quantitative way, um, this was a really good year, but there's not enough water in the system. There's, uh, if we think of all of the reservoirs, I think I have the wine gla glass coming up in a, sec in a second, but basically we have a narrow um, canyon that holds X amount of water. And then we start flooding the canyon, the, the surfaces, the terraces above the canyon, right? So when we're talking about having to fill up these reservoirs again, we're talking about the big fat part of the wine glass, not the stem. Uh, the stem is looking pretty bad right now. Um, so this is the most recent, uh, about a week ago, um, Lake Powell, it's rising. Uh, we worry about these elevations. These are the legal elevations that action occurs in. So if Lake Powell hits 
a 3525, then there is a water crisis and we're starting to talk about Cheyenne again. Lake Mead has a shortage and it has to, these elevations are above sea level. At 1050, Lake Mead is in crisis. So that means that um, Arizona is um, not getting most of its water deliveries. California, again, has this priority. So Arizona and California are really major players in who gets water and when. But if we look at the system, Lake Mead is 31% full, uh, Lake Powell 39% full, um, and then the peripheral reservoirs are doing pretty well. Fontenelle's 92, 83% for Flaming Gorge. So, but volumetrically in this bucket diagram, you can see that we can't necessarily save what we would really be worried about, which is Lake Powell and Lake Mead. There's not enough water upstream that we can flush. And so, and for instance, the, um, you might've seen that there was a, a release from Lake, uh, from Flaming Gorge, 500,000 acre feet. An acre foot can survive, supply uh, two households a year's worth of water. That's about what we're talking about. Um, they think that they, uh, well, last year they released 500,000 acre feet to augment Lake Powell. They stopped that flow two months early this year because of the snowpack. So again, you know, the snowpack did a really good thing and it's allowing us to sort of keep our smaller bank accounts full while we're waiting on what's going on downstream. But there's only two releases, maybe three again from Flaming Gorge to buy us a year or buy us six months. So it's, you yeah, know, like, wow, just, sorry. I geek out on that sort of stuff. So good news, Lake Powell is up 42.46 feet from a year ago, and um, it's at high water for the year end, and it's up from 61, about 62 feet from its low a couple years back. So we're getting the dramatic pictures of um, islands becoming islands again, rather than surfaces. Um, as a recommendation, do not take your vehicle onto these newly exposed surfaces because the Crust is only about two inches uh, thick, which is great for ice, but is awful for mud, and you might lose your vehicle. Um, Lake Powell, through the spring flood, has been rising about 0.8 feet a day, and then they're dumping water into Lake Mead as they're doing a hydrologic balance at about 0.3 feet per day. So this is good news. This is, this is buying us a few months through this water year. Um, if we look at the bigger context, why are we in this problem? One is that there is the Colorado River has never provided that much water. It's highly variable. And this is where science um, conflicts with management. Um, in the 1920s, the Colorado River Compact was negotiated. And at that point, um, it was a Herbert Hoover and uh, water engineers from the, the basin states got together and they were starting to make agreements on how much water uh, that uh, they were going to, to provide. And what was the upper basin? What was the lower basin? Hoover, uh, there's a geologist at the USGS, LaRue. He did the calculations for how much water is flowing through the Colorado, recognizing the droughts from the 1910, 1900. So he had a much better data set. Um, the negotiation was based on this particular period of high water flow. And so they were like, no, there's a ton of water when we're talking about it now. And so this sets the stage. LaRue said, no, there's not a lot of water. And Herbert Hoover said, you scientists, you don't know what you're talking about. We're negotiating. And so we're going to go ahead and ignore your data. Uh, and we get used to this after a while. Um, but we had this uh, early 20th century drought, we had the 1930s drought, we had the mid-century drought, um, and we're not to our drought yet, and then we have around 2000, the early 20th century uh, drought. Um, and that's okay. It's such an important caption that I thought I should, yeah, minor all the bottom. Um, 
But for the most part, you see that one, there wasn't an, as much water as the negotiated period said. And two, we've been decreasing in the amount of water. Now we talk about the millennium drought, which is uh, the one that we're, um, we're currently in. And I can't, I didn't punch it onto the time series, but for the most part, this is the inflows to Lake Powell. So now we're back at our invisible dividing point between the upper and lower basin. So inflow to Lake Powell is how much water the upper basin has been sending to the lower basin at that pinch point uh, where the dam is. And um, let's see, we were talking about uh, 1983, 1984. That's when Lake Powell was full. That's when we thought we were gonna lose Glen Canyon Dam. It was a big year. It punched a lot of water. There was a hurricane, Oscar came up from the Gulf of Mexico and it flooded basically the entire basin. Um, these might be, these are these extraordinary events. Um, and I'm gonna suggest that we don't plan water management about around extraordinary positive things um, as a suggestion. Um, as we move, so we have the water flow since the uh, dam was completed. Um, this is our line of obligation. So our legal line, 7.5 million acre feet on average over 10 years uh, based on the Colorado River Compact. And um, since we all play with data, um, there is a lot of information that is below that line for the millennium drought. So the drought that started around 2000. We are in deficit and it's a drought induced deficit. We're at least 23 years into this deficit. Um, 2019 was the year that I was on the river with the expedition. Uh, Lake Powell was rising about an inch a day while we were, you know, we had a big flow. We, we ran the river at 50, you know, through the upper basin at 54,000 cubic feet per second. It was massive water. And, you know, the, the reservoir did respond, but we also had three years of unprecedented low. We're on a pretty good high this year. So, um, you know, what extraordinary event should we be planning our water utilization for? Uh, what we have, um, this is the Colorado River storage um, project generation versus demand. Um, and this is basically uh, how we manage the system is through energy production. Um, Glen Canyon Dam is the big energy producer. Again, this stabilizes the Western grid. Um, for the most part, it allows air conditioners to run in Phoenix, Los Angeles, Las Vegas um, uh, pretty consistently. Uh, we have a uh, time of day. You can tell when people wake up and you can tell when they go to bed. So the river is run uh, through, they call them tides within. This is mostly going to be talking about the Grand Canyon section. So if you are on a river trip or if you've been on a river trip, and you've ever had to move a boat, this is what we're dealing with. This is the power generation. And the Colorado River Storage Project is really about energy. Glen Canyon Dam provides the energy for the water pumps, um, not, not only to stabilize the grid, but also that's how we move water into Central Arizona Project. Uh, so another major water delivery system. How it looks in stream time, um, there's, this is, these modifications are the science of the river science now for the Colorado River Basin. It's an incredibly managed and well-known system. Um, we, using the pointer, yeah, I'd like to be over here, but, uh, so this is coming out of spring. And, um, and then we have these, this sort of weird anomaly here. And then we have a, this, and then this is dam operations. Um, so the spring, we're not needing the energy. We don't need to have air conditioning run. So we don't have these uh, daily um, charges going into the system. This event, 40,000 cubic feet per second coming out of Glen Canyon Dam, we're in a water crisis. Why would we release water like that? This is part of the science. This is how we're actually managing the system for these multiple users. One, we need to get water down to Lake Mead. And we have, a, we have this great channel called the Grand Canyon. So that's awesome. 
Um, two, we now have science that's dictating what we do. Uh, Endangered Species Act, all of these, um, as I, I talk about them, all these jobs bills uh, that provide ecologists with employment, right? So we have, uh, we have fish, um, fish habitat that needs to be maintained. We also have a recreation industry. And as a question, do you like sleeping on rocky beaches or sandy beaches? Sandy, thank you. And so what happens is that when they made um, Glen Canyon Dam, yeah, so the problem is when we put in Glen Canyon Dam, we were also going to put in Marble Canyon. And so in 63, they blasted the bottom of the river channel and moved all the sediment out of there. So we had great beaches in the 70s and 80s because that residual material went up onto the sides and then but they, but they, they've actually took the, the sediment load out of the Grand Canyon. The Colorado is very silty. And so now we have two rivers that provide sediment to the system, and that's the Perea. And so right when you start your trip through the Grand Canyon, the first river coming in is coming uh, is one sediment source, and then the other is Little Colorado. And so what we do now, is when there is enough extra water, and this might be the last of these, they call them high flow experiments. Um, when there's enough water, they will blast the bottom of the channel and mobilize the sediment from the, uh, the two tributaries that are the only two tributaries that are putting sediment into the Grand Canyon section, which is great for the tourism. It also is great for the fish because that creates backwater habitats and the you know uh, predation goes down. So um, because of the sediment flush, um, what it does is it starts taking these features. This is a Redwall caver Cavern, um, that beautiful beach there, that's a product of these high flow experiments. That is constantly eroding Lake uh, Mead is filling up with sediment. There's a delta progression in Lake Mead, but we want these sediments um, because it makes our experience better. And if we are experiencing it, then we're going to care about these spaces. Um, this is uh, Vasey's Paradise. Uh, this was completely dry in 2019. The meteoric water is um, infiltrating and it was flushing this year probably 60 to 100 cubic feet per second coming out of the spring. Um, the Grand Canyon also has cultural resources. These high flow events create sediments. This is Anasazi Bridge. It's like a 700 year old uh, bridge, but um, a lot of the archeological sites are actually buried by the sediment that's being uh, deposited on the beach and then uh, blows around. Uh... Welcome Pat. Um, so the beach building experiment, experiences, uh, experiments have been one of these ways where we know what the man, so primary is energy and water distribution, but now the environmental needs, because we have subsequent laws, you know, Endangered Species Act being a major one that require us to do different management strategies. And so how do we negotiate the science and the aquatic system needs to the management of water distribution. The high flow experiments used to be in the fall. It turns out that a lot of, uh, a lot of fish are not breeding in the fall, uh, you know, none of them. So if we start calibrating when we do these releases and these experiments with what nature would like, we actually get more bang for our buck. Um, as far as the science is concerned. But it does take a lot of negotiation because the Bureau of Reclamation, they're there to distribute water and make energy. Um, so uh, the high flow experiments, just uh, quickly, um, they're designed to move sediment from the river bottom to the river margin. Um, and it roughly values um, about $25 million a year for the river. So. As we're talking about management, we you know what's the economics of say maintaining something for a fish, um, and so that's how the science is actually being funded, often through the energy development of the dam itself. 
um, we're asking for a, a little cut to try this experiment. And these have been pretty, um, uh, pretty successful. Um, this is a national canyon um, that basically there was a giant flood blowout created cobbles. Um, this year, that same area, you know, probably three to five feet of sediment. Um, uh, so all of a sudden you have a nice beach to camp on, um, but we're also uh, remobilizing that material and getting it into the terrestrial sphere. Another thing that is happening, um, and this is sort of, again, um, to enhance endangered species and sort of the aquatic biodiversity, but it also helps with uh, recreational fisheries. Um, the Grand Canyon section has a pretty low aquatic uh, fish diversity compared to other sections of the river. Uh, this is a caddisfly and that's a pseudo scorpion that was parasitizing its mandible. Um, and what we're seeing is a dammed river with the hydro peaking um, has less insect diversity. And so what is going on there is in the Grand Canyon section, you could have two feet of water rise overnight. So again, if you're doing a river run, that's a lot because all of a sudden your boats are stranded. If you are a fish and you're trying to lay your eggs at the water line and it's going to move two feet, your eggs either drown or they desiccate in that 12 hour period. And so this is another, you know, it's like, well, can we manipulate dam operations um, to do something like that? And uh, so what they do now is they'll have seven days of um, ramp up, ramp down, nor operations as normal. And then the weekends, they'll do the bug experiments. And what's interesting about this, this is the USGS um, uh, project. Um, they started off relatively cheap, about $165,000 a year in you know, what was law, energy uh, production loss. Uh, currently, it's 1.4 million a year. So we're now getting into like people getting nervous. That's a big number, um, but we are seeing wholesale energy markets uh, prices changing. And so this is another impact of the prolonged drought: is can we afford to do a high flow experiment? Can we afford to release that much water over two weeks? Even though we're capturing again downstream, can we afford to increase the um, aquatic insect uh, production so the fish are healthier because we're spending you know forty million dollars or whatever to uh, conserve those species? So this gets really complicated, and so it's and and these are all of the um, aspects that are starting to come into play as we're rolling into the future. Um, this is from, uh, this just quickly, uh, we did a bat survey on our trip. And uh, one of the things is that uh, um, might not surprise you, from Green River, Wyoming, down to Lake Mead, bat, uh, bat populations change quite a bit. The Grand Canyon section has probably the highest bat diversity. Um, but if we improve the food webs, these are species of concern, and so they might tell us something about the health, and then linking it to agriculture, maybe the health of the pollinators. Uh, there's a lot of ways that we can use these biological indicators. Um, we do, you know, this is just sort of uh, bat activity. Big bats seem to be out early, and then little bats take over uh, about midnight or so. So if you're a bat fanatic um, and you have a little bat recorder, uh, you can kind of see the big bats um, earlier in the evening or wake up early in the morning um, and they're out there as well. The little bats are about, you know, six hours after sunset. Um, and the bats have different activities based on different, you know, we, we change rivers from pool, riffle, glide. Um, and so glide would be a moving river, no rapid. Riffle would be the rapids and then still would be the reservoirs. And we do see that we're seeing different populations, um, the numbers of bats in each of these sections. 
the riffles um, actually have more bats than we expected, uh, which uh, we, and bat trivia. Um, water temperature, so the, I'm just kind of going through all my vignettes of like what we're thinking about as far as this river is concerned. Water temperature below Glen Canyon Dam, our midpoint, are basically spring water temperatures if you were starting in Wyoming on May 24th. So Grand Canyon is in perpetual spring, and that's how it's been stabilized for about 50 years. Uh, we see this is just the color. As the colors get lighter, uh, water is getting warmer, so it's cool um, uh, on May 24th. And then Lake Powell is pretty warm water. And then on the bottom side of the dam, how we've been doing things, uh, the, the lake is stratified. And so the thermocline is been, has been above the water intakes. So the dam is designed for cold water to move through it. And as the thermocline, as the lake level has gone down, um, as the lake level has gone down, the warm water is now going into the intakes of the dam. Warm water going through turbines that are meant to be using cold water is bad. That messes with the machine. Um, now the river, it also um, affects the, in, the, the endangered species, the native fish. This is a humpback chub. We've been studying those for uh, probably 40 years in the Grand Canyon section. We know a lot about them. Um, but when we dropped the thermocline, uh, something unexpected happened. The smallmouth bass were now at the intake. So one, we have our turbines that don't like warm water experiencing warm water. So this is a management problem we have. We got to think about how we're operating the dam. But because management now has the science and, you know, like we have the system stabilized in this perpetual spring, smallmouth bass are a warm water species. We spent 40 years conserving humpback chub downstream. These smallmouth bass are making it through the turbines. And, you know, in, in first blush, you would go, oh, well, maybe they'll just get chummed up or chopped up as they're going through the turbines. Some of them are surviving. And so now we have this new problem. How do you actually run water through the dam and still prevent these smallmouth bass? So as we, again, this warming of the system and the changing of the water levels has all of these crazy unintended consequences that we're just now figuring out. We had no idea this would happen. Um, so you know, little fish, little, little fish. And I, I did hear, and I don't know if it's true, but I like the story so much that they're thinking about little fish drones and then sending those through the turbines to see how big of a fish you have to be to get chopped up. Um, and I think that's just really good science. Uh, um, the, like I, I mentioned in the beginning, uh, Glen Canyon Dam hasn't been running uh, at capacity for a while. Um, the, the turbines are, it's about 36% lower than the 30-year uh, average. So we're not getting as much electricity out of it. And so as with, you know, my example with Navajo, um, the coal generating station at Navajo, um, you know, what's the dollar figure that maintain, that allows us to maintain this infrastructure, which is 50 years old. Um, so we have aging infrastructure. Now we're compromising it with warm water going through it. Yeah, these are, these are actually the real questions that we need to be asking because there's a lot that goes into, you know, a block of concrete that's big, that, that is that big and actually that important to our, uh, our energy budget. Um, the average loss uh, in energy with these lower lake levels and the lower productivity is about $32 million. Um, that was for this year or last year through April. That was the last numbers I could get. Um, so we're thinking about these lower water levels, these narrowing of the streams. Um, and, you know, we want to start thinking about how do we move forward? Because 
when the infrastructure went in, we didn't have the laws that we have now. So we have, uh, you know, I've used the Endangered Species Act. We have the Environmental Protection Acts. We, there's a lot of legislation. Um, archaeological sites, if they're exposed, are, do we have an obligation, um, you know, since the 1970s when you know, the Nixon administration put a bunch of this, this legislation in place? What's our obligation in the management of the system that's now exposing all of this material? Uranium tailings that were underwater are now exposed. You know, this is, you know, what do we do with these things? Um, the capacity of Lake Powell, this is, everybody was really happy about this graphic because it does a really good job of showing what we have. Filling up Lake Powell is not deemed necessarily possible at this point. We don't see a future where we're going to see the reservoir fill up because this is this is easy to fill. Um, we got to our uh, thirty percent full, so we have a lot of wine glass to move up um, before we can do anything. And so, one is thinking about how do we change the management of the system that satisfies our uh, societal needs and the environmental needs as, as society has changed and brought the environmental needs up to uh, something that something equal to energy production. And we're seeing this within a lot of energy markets anyway. Um, for like for um, Glen Canyon Dam, uh, what we have are eight diversions that go through the power. Those are like fire hoses. They can move a lot of water. They have four um, jet tubes that have never run 24 hours a day. And that would be if we um, aren't running water through the turbines, we run them through the system that hasn't actually been tested for what we would need. And so this is the current state of the dam. And the Bureau of Reclamation is thinking about this um, uh, quite a bit. So uh, it's fun, you search the internet and you start thinking, wow, I'm an engineer now. Um, and so these are just some of the ideas they have. One is to actually lower the intake physically into the dam, you know, put a cage over it, drill in, and then put a new power head in. Um, you know, that would buy us another 125 feet of water drawdown, but... Uh, I guess, you know, my skepticism is we're now into the narrow part. So that's uh, an easier haul than it is if we're in the big wine glass part. Um, and there's some uh, increased risk of penetration through dam, meaning um, concrete failure, and that would be bad. Uh, the Bureau runs all of these scenarios. I mean, they're obligated to run these scenarios. And so um, they're doing, a, I feel, a pretty complete job with the five that are most reasonable. Um, another one is just to drill through the Navajo sandstone, which is much more permeable and engineeringly would be easy. And then they could actually just change the penstock and change the turbine, abandon what the dam is doing, and then they could let as much water or as little water out as they wanted. And so it, it's almost like business as usual with a few years of engineering through the soft rock. Um, but uh, there's some design things. Um, and then they're putting out there, I mentioned the high flow experiments. You could see that they're considering recreation as part of this actual strategy. It's like, oh, like, we like the high flow experiments. Um, so um, there are, a, you know, and one is abandon the dam altogether, but I like that one because they say, well, we don't own any land, so that's not a scenario that we would deal with. So, you know, you know but that's, that's option five. Um, one of the things, though, as we, as I, I, I'm trying to land this, is that um, the inflows, the lowest inflow was 2018. Prior to, you know, we had 2002. We're really not on track for a lot of water if our average median is up that high. 
So if we're looking at graphs and we can't, and we're looking consistently over 20 years that we're not even hitting our median, which is, you know, going back to stats, that's the good scenario. Uh, average can fluctuate, but median usually tells you the truth. Um, you know, we're not doing so great as far as our inflows into um, Lake Powell. And so I don't see why we would expect the future to be much better. Um, this is the one that's making the news. Lone Rock got less lonely. Um, so this is Lone Rock in 2021. Um, it now has water around it. But again, we can't really depend on a few months of benefit to, um, to say that the problem is solved. So the future is now. Um, John Wesley Powell had a quote about this. This is, you know, 1869, 1872. He's giving talks like this. Years of drought and famine come and years of uh, year, years of famine come and years of flood and famine come and climate is not changing with dance life and climate is not changed with dance libation or prayer. We knew that this was a problem coming into the system. We managed through an optimistic period. Um, we said that we were going to let the future figure it out. The future is here. Um, we're working hard to try to figure it out. So my suggestion for the future is hold on. It's going to be a bumpy ride. I promised a couple of white water shots. This is Lava Falls. And that's what it looks like when you succeed uh, through a run and not flip. Uh, with that, I'll uh, open it up to questions, discussion, uh, whatever you would like. Group hug. <laughs> Yeah. Um, well, that's a question I can't answer. Uh, not as much as, as was. Uh, Lake Powell, I think, had a lifespan of 200 some odd years. So we got about 150, and that's cutting most of the sediment. That was part, it's partially a big sediment trap. Um, but both both reservoirs, um, because the water level is lower, that the delta is now prograding towards the dams themselves. So it actually is, this drought is reducing the lifespan of the lower, um, the lower uh, feeds. So um, like Lake Powell, I do know we got about 110 feet before it plugs up the bottom holes. Uh, and that's moving kind of quickly right now. But Lake, uh, Lake Mead, that was kind of saved by 1963. Um, yeah. That's the graph that had a daily flow fluctuation of significant amount. You had some laptop graphs. Oh, um, yeah, I, I should have explained that better. Um, Oh, these are the bug flows. And so that is so that is um, showing a normal flow. So um, prior to the last few years, in the summer, you would you would think about an 8,000 to about 12, 14,000 cubic feet per second fluctuation. 8,000 is what the dory boats like. So this is actually a negotiated space. And then the bug flows would be two days of constant flow, and then they increase the flow because we want to. We're also doing a mass balance with how much water is going in. Um, so, and then the other figure I showed is um, is this, and this is spring flow. This is the high flow event. And then they dropped it, and then they actually flushed a bunch of water down to Lake Mead. So this was actually a rescue flow to bring the water level of Lake Mead up. And then we are now seeing hydro peaking, but no bug flows in the current flow regime. Is that variation based on power generation or is it just arbitrary flow flows? 
power generation this is the this is a management decision that's a management decision and that's power generation daily power generation requirement goes up and down yeah and and in the system you know when you, you know, i showed the ramp up we know that around 6 a.m people are going to turn their air conditioners on um, office buildings through the day and then the ramp down is about nine o'clock at night on how much power is demanded by the system. Oh. See if the chat has something. Uh, okay. Bob, do we have any chat questions? Uh, yeah, Tom, we do. Okay. There's a question, actually two questions from Nan. Uh, she asked about what about bathtub rings that form on the rocks? Is it from deposition of minerals? Is it from erosion uh, of the water or is it a chemical change? Can you answer that first? And then her second question is what about the wildcat communities? Where do they get their water? Okay. Uh, the bathtub rings are removing the oxides off of the sandstones. I'm looking for help. So that's basically moving, removing the oxides off the sandstone. So the native stone would be white. And then, um, uh, so when you see fresh cliff falls, you'll see that it's always white, but that, so the bathtub ring is basically chemical dissolution. Uh, the wildcat communities, um, initially they, there was a tap in um, Scottsdale that they were being allowed to use. And uh, now they've, uh, I think the Gila Indian tribe is providing them water, but they have to drive like two and a half hours to fill up uh, a tank. So it's, so one of the things that came out of our discussions on water um, in the West, if you're plumbed, you're probably okay. So there are, you know, so the, the way we have the system now Rural is probably not where you want to invest in a new home. Uh, being in the major cities where the plumbing, where you're connected to the plumbing of the Colorado is, is uh, for water supply, a safer bet. Um, unless it's like the Cheyenne situation where, you know, that, that would just, you know, who's going to buy a house and think, oh, I wonder what my water right is, is in our community. Uh, I, other than everybody here today now that you know that that's a thing. Okay, thank you, Tom. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is there a relationship between all these changes of water flux and the ground the groundwater? Okay, so the question is, is there a change between the fluctuations and the groundwater? Um, physically, there has to be. But in how the system is talked about, we don't discuss groundwater necessarily. Um, groundwater is considered a, a different system. Um, and um, the, I think the more there's, there's been satellite imagery of, uh, now we can actually f calculate groundwater from satellites. And uh, that system came in at the beginning of the millennium drought. And one of the reasons that we've delayed talking about the drought as a water crisis is that um, the supply has been subsidized by people putting a lot of wells into the ground. And, um, and then how we've been doing the mass balance of the river system of the, so I am not sure the data are there because we, uh, wells aren't, um, rivers are managed or are monitored by USGS quite well, uh, wells or not. So we don't we don't have a common data set. Okay, yeah. Tom. Here's another question from Hunter, who asks the 1922 law of the river agreement based the total use of water between the upper and lower basin totaling 15 million feet. Yes. Moving to the next law of river agreement to be negotiated by 2026, 
what is a realistic total of water in million acre of feet that was sustainable moving forward? Um, I'm hearing 13 and 12. So a lot less um, because that's what the river is, is providing now. So probably 12, I, I would go for the smaller number because then you know we're at least within parameters that we can believe, but uh, I would say probably about 12, 13. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, do the turbines have a preference for the cold water instead of the warm water? <laughs> I think they do you know, because it, the machinery heats up. And so yeah, I'm not sure if it's just thermal expansion but it's there's a they are they're designed for a water temperature uh yeah the system is it's interesting to yeah and what happens to the fish when they don't move? if they're a big fish they get chummed up um it's the little fish that are surviving so they did find small mouth bass in the grand canyon section and that was that was a problem uh, I think, I believe that they poisoned the upper reach of the river um, in response. Yeah. Yeah. Back to fish and the turbines that are easier on fish. Turbine designs. Uh, um, are there turbine designs that are easier on fish? I don't. I, I'm just a simple caveman ecologist. <laughs> I, 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 I'm. If I knew that, I would definitely have an answer for you. <laughs> Sir. So the sediment load is going to increase the um, turbo level inputs and make the dam uh, not feasible anymore. Uh -huh. uh, we have ship channels we can stretch and clean them out. I'm sure that that could be done. Um, so the question is, uh, could we dredge the sediment um, as we start plugging up the holes in Glen Canyon Dam? Uh, they've talked about a pipeline, but they, um, so the issue is that you, well, you, you would need to have a port, like, uh, like you know, uh, some sort of channel for the sediment to go into, which would then shorten the lifespan of Lake Mead because we, you know, there's the, yeah, so, you know, ask, you know, be careful what we ask for. Magic has a price. Um, but it's also 300 feet below the surface of the dam. So you would actually, like, how would you move that material through a canyon? And the canyon, uh, like, the news is also that the canyon is reemerging. So the access points, um, currently with the lake level being higher, I'm seeing that a lot of the marinas are... Yeah, they're like, well, use it your own risk, or we can 25 foot boats or less, that kind of. So we're getting access to the lake itself, the reservoir itself. But commercially or physically, how would you get that material out of it? And I think it's um, 15 five ton dump trucks per second of sediment is coming into the lake. Like it's a, it's a phenomenal amount of sediment um, that's coming in in the slurry. So, uh, and somebody should check me on that figure, but I'm pretty close that it's, it's, it's a big number of mud. So uh, they, they have talked about a slurry system to, for beach building, you know, but that would be sucking it from the top and then running it down 173 miles. Yeah. This is gonna be happening for a while. So it's a, uh, Kind of, uh, it's an exciting time if you've been studying drought uh, over millennia to see one at this um, scale right now. Uh, people ask me why I smile when I say things like that. It's just because it's it's just so insane. Um, any other questions from Zoom? No, not at the moment. All right. Well, I won't belabor the point. Um, Thank you all for coming out. I really appreciate it.
dip in here. So thank you very much, Tom. Uh, as always, it's a pleasure to have you and JJ, your wife, as well. So uh, just a little a gift here from the geologist of Jackson Hole. Thank you very much. It's a uh, cube of pyrite um, acquired by Mike Schur, who does a great job with our speaker gifts. Um, so thanks everybody for coming out. And if you, you can turn on your cell phones again, and uh, if you would please help stack the stairs, that would be most appreciated. Thanks everybody on Zoom, and we will um, see you next month. Thanks. <laughs> Safe again. Um, and Bob Chilling, uh, you could stop the recording now. Okay, will do.